today. We're going to have Dr. Catherine Liebernick, who's going to sort of talk about the Texas Metro Observatory and sort of what we're about, what we're up to. Uh, and then we have Stephen Richter, a PhD student who's been sort of a central uh, force in the Texas Metro Observatory today. Uh, and then I'll be presenting uh, as well. So I want to turn it over to Dr. Liebernick, and she'll uh, lead us off. All right. Thanks, Michael. All right. Turn on this mic, maybe. Thank you. Is that on? Yeah, okay. And this is recording for the video. Great. Well, it's good to see you guys. Um, this is exciting. We've been working on this particular project for just over a year, and this is, I think, our first public presentation of this piece of it. So it's nice to be in kind of our home court, so to speak, with y'all. Um, so as Michael was saying, I'm just going to kind of kick us off and talk a little bit about the overall framing of the project. And then Michael's going to talk about the, the people part, demographics. Stephen's going to talk about the land, uh, so the land cover, land use data that he's been looking at. And I'll, I'll wrap it up looking or talking about some of the water findings. That's kind of the, the menu ahead of you. So I just wanted to frame this a little bit. The Texas Metro Observatory, which we're about to talk about in more detail, is part of um, UT Austin's kind of grand challenge initiative. So UT, like a lot of big research universities, have started these Grand Challenge programs um, as a way to kind of harness uh, all the big brains, the researchers on a campus, and keep on producing knowledge, which is what we do in addition to teaching, but also try to have more of an application focus to that knowledge. So trying to use all that knowledge production to try to address big societal problems. So UT has three of these Grand Challenges. One's focused on resilience, called Plant Texas 2050, so that's what TMO, Texas Metro Observatory, is kind of nested under. There's one on communities and health, whole communities, whole health, looking for designing kind of a new approach to community-wide health. Um, and then there's one called Good Systems, focused on my understanding, I don't see Dr. Zhao, but it's the ethics of AI, of artificial intelligence. So Dr. Zhao's on that leadership team. I'm on the leadership team of Plant Texas 2050. So these are like eight to 10 year long programs. So the one we want to focus on resilience for Plant Texas 2050, so thinking about four systems, water and energy, ecosystems and cities, their interactions, producing more knowledge about those interactions, but also working with communities to develop strategies for resilience. Like what, what's the point? Why does it matter? How does it work? So that's Plant Texas 2050. Um, Texas Metro Observatory, at this point, year three of, of Plant Texas 2050, we have about 30 different research projects under our umbrella-ish. And Texas Metro Observatory is one of them. And that's what we're talking about today. So the idea behind this is that we are, it's not quite present tense, but it's almost present tense, <laughs> developing a communication and data platform um, that you can go to and do a couple different things. You can receive kind of digested reports and visualizations focused on Texas metropolitan areas. So metropolitan areas, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's where most of us in Texas live, about almost 90% live in cities and kind of the surrounding areas. So sharing information and ideas about these communities where most of us live, understanding common problems. If you kind of look across the state at these 25 metro areas, there probably are a common set of challenges in most of them. So kind of in aggregate, can we start to figure out some of the solutions by examining these patterns of urbanization in these areas? So that's what we're kind of are after. And, um, you might think, which we did, and when we got initial feedback on this at a series of workshops the first summer, I was like, really? <laughs> another data platform? <laughs> another data information exchange platform? Yes, there are a lot. They're kind of ubiquitous. We think this one's critical because we're Texas. <laughs> because, we, because Texas always wants one, too. We want one that is focused on urban, urbanizing in urban Texas, right? That I think you guys all know Texas culturally, historically, um, in our blood that runs orange, we're rural in imagery, but most of us now live in cities or areas around cities, right? We're urbanized. So we really wanted a place to have an evolving discourse, a place to talk about this change that's happened in Texas that's really critical for many things, for social and ecological systems, political systems. Um, and this, over time, you can see the, the lighter blue-gray is the percentage of population starting in 1900, moving to 2015, that is rural, is the blue, the light blue, the gray, and the dark gray is, is metro. So you can see over time, we really are predominantly a metropolitan place. 
our communities. Not that rural communities aren't critical and important, they are, um, but metro areas need some focus as well. So that was kind of the driving piece behind it. And this is just a, a map, and I apologize. Who's from El Paso? Here. So <laughs> yes. So this is from a um, PDF, so it's a two-page spread. Yeah, <laughs> a two-page spread. So you guys got cut off, but I bring you back in later. But these are the 25 metropolitan statistical areas across the state um, where so many of us live. The other th reason we wanted to start TMO was not just to have a place where you can go to learn about Texas urban and urbanizing communities, but also because so much of the research that is focused on these areas is you know, focused here in our home place, in the Texas Triangle, which there's a lot of value in that research, um, but there's a lot of places to stretch out of that Texas Triangle, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and examine the patterns and processes that are happening in other communities across the state that probably have commonalities and simil similar challenges, but don't always have the same attention paid to kind of the big four. So originally that was really our vision, that we want this to be an observatory, a place where we can gather, come together, share information, share resources, share discussion, um, and kind of elevate uh, discussions about urban Texas at a state scale. So those of you who are PR and thesis students for the planning program, I know you hear from us all the time, we've got a narrow, narrow, narrow topic. So we heard this too. We wanted to do all these things at first, kind of just create this really um, grand scale data repository. The feedback we got early on was that just focus on your expertise areas first, focus on producing some useful data products that could be interesting, that could be applicable beyond academia, maybe journalists would be interested in it, um, policymakers, policymakers staff members, and um, focus on the work that, existing work that we already have here as a faculty, as students, and kind of creating this place um, this platform to be a place where we can share that work more broadly and start to see, hey, what's happening over at Rice when people are thinking about these patterns? You know, what's happening um, in the Rio Grande Valley when people are thinking about these same kind of patterns? So that's the idea now. We've kind of scoped down a little bit. So I want to leave it at that kind of general intro to Texas Metro Observatory. We're happy to take questions about that or Plant Texas later. Um, this is our first report. This is why we're speaking today. We just wrapped this up. Um, I think the final copy was a week ago, so uh, designed and laid out by really um, skillfully by uh, Geo Song, I guess is our last name. And so you'll see some of the graphics from it throughout this, but it's focused on kind of three indicator, indicator areas. People, so demographics, which Michael's going to cover. Stephen's going to do land, use and land cover, and I'm going to talk about water at the end. So here's Michael. And here's people. <coughs> Yeah, so this is a recording. There you go. Um, so together with um, two really terrific RAs, Rachel Thomas last year and Lucy Hall this year, um, I've really been concentrating on patterns of socioeconomic change and socioeconomic characteristics in all of the Texas metro regions. And today what I'm presenting really is a kind of high altitude uh, flyover of some sort of differences between metro regions, uh, but also some very interesting but very general and simple trends. Uh, we're cranking away on census tract level data and doing the similarity indexes and all of that stuff. But today I'm just going to do a kind of uh, general flyover and try to identify uh, general and sort of interesting trends in the growth dynamics of Texas metropolitan regions. Um, as we've already seen, there are 25 census-designated MSAs in Texas. They're, of course, dominated by the big four, where a little over 60% of the total Texas state population lives in these metro areas. Uh, but there are also a lot of larger metros, McAllen, Edinburgh, Mission, which actually nosed ahead of El Paso as the uh, fifth largest metro, uh, nosed ahead th two or three years ago. And other large areas like Corpus Christi, and then there's some very small, smaller metro areas, San Angelo, Victoria, Texarkana, et cetera. But 24.4 um, million Texans live, as a, uh, this is in 2015, 
uh, live in metro areas or approaching 90% of the state population lives in metro areas. Now it's important to realize that people who live in metropolitan regions do not consider themselves as living in an urban region, many of them. Uh, so these metro regions include core urban areas, classic suburbs, exurbs, and lots of relatively rural areas where people live and perceive of themselves as being rural residents. But they live in these census designated metropolitan regions. Um, you can look at certain sorts of differences uh, kind of cross-sectionally between these metro areas. This is a measure of educational attainment. People over 25 years old with a bachelor's degree or greater. Uh, I don't call it, I don't like the term human capital measure. But it's, a, it's a measure of educational attainment. And uh, the state of Texas uh, has a, an aggregated sense, a lower level of educational attainment by this measure than the nation. Um, and uh, highest levels of educational attainment are in the big metro areas. Austin is really an outlier. We're usually in the top five or six of having the highest ratio of people with bachelor's degree or more in our population in the United States. Uh, but the larger metro areas, uh, Bryan College Station's a bit of a college town effect uh, where A&M is. But um, then you have um, uh, Texas metros with really pretty low levels of educational attainment, again, by this measure. Uh, so there's sort of differences there between more kind of centralized, uh, uh, by and large, centralized urban areas and these uh, smaller, more dispersed urban areas. And then we have the kind of borderlands region, which I'll talk about in a minute. We can also look at median income differences. Again, the state of Texas, in terms of median income, has a slightly lower median income than the nation. Um, we have median income in oil patch cities being very high. Uh, Midland has like a really high uh, median income. That's where the oil field executives live. But even Odessa, which has, as we saw earlier, a very low level of educational attainment by the college measure, uh, has high median income. And of course, Austin is sort of second place to Midland, which again is a, a kind of peculiar uh, characteristic. And then we have uh, relatively low income uh, metro areas, um, again, sort of uh, clustered in the borderland. So when we look at a range of characteristics, in addition to the ones I've just touched upon, uh, we can sort of create some broader regions with uh, sort of clusters of factors that are, that are similar. And in the case of Texas, uh, I think you could certainly say the Texas borderlands have a lot of unique characteristics that are not uh, common uh, to the other Texas, or are, are less common to the other Texas metros. Um, and the borderlands uh, regions basically are based on uh, a lot of trade, uh, some agricultural activity, uh, and sort of trade and processing. Um, Generally speaking, they have lower income levels, lower levels of educational attainment, and significantly higher poverty rates. And over the 25-year over the period that we're examining, uh, the borderlands grew a little bit faster than uh, the state of Texas as a whole. So fast growing, uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, a low wage uh, set of economies. Uh, they would be the 60s, the 30s, they'd be a little bit larger than Kansas if they were a state. And interesting, one interesting finding is that average annual population growth, this is on an average annual basis, was 3.7% from 90 to 2010. In the post-recession period, borderlands population growth has slowed to a crawl. Uh, it's only been 0.37% on an average annual basis. And I think uh, a case could be made that this is due to increased border frictions uh, at a variety of levels. Immigration takes longer to get through border crossings. It's just kind of gummed up the economies of these areas, which is, have always been transnational economies. Um, another kind of cluster would be the Texas Triangle. The Texas Triangle really is the kind of engine room 
of the Texas boom. Um, you know, um, uh, the Triangle population uh, was you know, over 19 million by 2015, has higher median income, higher educational attainment, lower poverty rates than the state. Um, and if, if you looked at the Texas Triangle alone, it would be the fifth largest state in the union, uh, just a tad bit smaller than the state of New York. Uh, so it's a pretty big and dynamic region. And 85% of the state's growth over the last 25 years has been in this triangle region. Uh, so this is really, uh, really the kind of dynamic, sort of economic and population growth uh, center of Texas. If we look at change over time, and all these change over time numbers, the data sources are uh, decennial census 90, decennial census 2000, ACS data for 2010 and 2015. It's the latest we could get. Uh, and we look at population change patterns uh, over this period. And booming metros, these are metros that have higher population growth rates than the metropolitan average growth. Uh, Austin, Round Rock, uh, the borderlands uh, cities over the 1915 period, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston is fa the fast growing metros are a little bit slower growth than metro average, but higher growth rates than the state average growth rate. Um, and then slow growing metros are metros that are growing at a slower rate than the state of Texas population. Interestingly, there are no declining metro regions in Texas. And the only region that has a slower, and again, in period growth rate 90 to 215, than the national growth rate of 28%, we only have one region, Beaumont, Port Arthur, that grew at a slower rate than the national growth rate. Um, if we look at the last five year chunk, the post-recession period, there were kind of shifts in these growth, in these longer term growth patterns. As we, you know, just suggested, the borderlands areas growth really kind of uh, uh, decelerated substantially. Um, and Waco jumped into the booming metros. They would tell you it was because of a home improvement show. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, all the triangle cities, the big triangle cities now are in the booming metro area. So post-recession, the Triangle Cities really um, uh, sort of took off. Um, you know, we all kind of know this, or we've heard this, uh, and um, um, we know the trend is that the state and the cities within the state are becoming more diverse. But I think when we look at some of these numbers, we can kind of fully appreciate the stunning increase in diversity uh, in uh, metropolitan areas that's been occurring in Texas over the last 25 years. Um, the white non-Hispanic Latino population uh, in metropolitan areas, this is the whole metro uh, for the 17, um, increased by 1.95 million people over this 25-year uh, period, but the share of population in the metro areas went from 57.7% in 1990 to 41% in 2015. Um, the African-American population increased by about 1.3 million in all the Texas metro areas aggregated again, uh, but its share was almost, had almost no change. It maintained its share, grew about as fast as metro population in general. Uh, the uh, Hispanic population increased by 5.8 million, uh, went from 27% of total aggregate metro population to 40%. And the fastest growing from a pretty low base uh, was the um, Asian American population, uh, which uh, increased to 5.8% from a fairly low uh, base. Uh, so we really see, uh, in an aggregate sense, Texas metro areas, uh, white, non-Hispanic, Latino households, uh, uh, residents have 
become a minority in an aggregated sense. Uh, and this is only a 25 year period, so pretty stunning change. We also really kind of focused on, if we look over this 25 period, what have the shifts been between urban and suburban areas? Uh, and this is a, might seem obvious, but it's really tricky uh, to define suburbs versus uh, urban areas. Um, you know, there's forests have been cleared for the literature that says you should define it this way, you should define it that way. So we took a pretty simple definition and we said, we defined urban areas as all incorporated districts or census places with over 25,000 population in a metro region and has 75% or less single detached housing as a share of total housing units. The jurisdictions we designated as urban exhibited more diverse land uses uh, and function more as employment and development centers in suburban. So basically the way we're defining this, and this is important because what I'm gonna tell is very sensitive to these definitions, is we define urban areas and then everything else in the metro area we call suburban. Uh, so uh, this was tough to do in and of itself. So if we look at this urban versus suburban population shares of the MSA, we do over the long-term period see uh, a pretty significant suburbanization trend. Uh, in 1990, 66% of the population of these 17 Texas metro areas lived in urban areas. Uh, by uh, 2015, uh, that share had fallen to uh, 59% that live in urban versus suburban areas. Uh, so pretty strong suburbanization trend over the long period. Uh, however, in the post-recession period, and you know, this was one of the kind of underlying motivating research questions that we're, that we're trying to address is, are Texas cities experiencing this thing that we've labeled urban inversion? In other words, after decades and decades of suburban growth and suburban growth outstripping urban growth, are we now moving into a period when urban growth is actually starting to revive and outstrip suburban growth? And uh, there was definitely a shift in trends over the past five year period. And the urban share of the total metro population increased um, in seven uh, of the uh, 17 metros that we're studying here. Uh, and as because some of these were big, the uh, MSA average, actually the share of the aggregated MSA average that was urban versus suburban ticked up a little bit. Now, this is not, it's too short a time period. The, it's too fragile uh, a finding because of the definitional issues and everything else. So yeah, Texas is undergoing a reversion. Only seven of the 17 uh, actually experienced that. But at minimum, we can say that the urban inversion hypothesis is not disproved uh, by uh, our findings from these Texas metros. Um, we also see um, significant changes in the urban racial and ethnic composition with the white, non-Hispanic or Latino share again going down uh, in the urban part of the metro regions, but also in the suburban. So suburban areas of metro regions are becoming substantially more diversified too uh, over time um, as the state becomes uh, more diverse. If we look at race and ethnicity in these metro areas. The red are metro areas where there was um, a white, non-Hispanic, or Latino majority in both 90 and 215. Uh, the blue are white, non-Hispanic minority in both 1990 and 2015. And the green are ones that changed. They had, they had a white, uh, non-Hispanic, uh, Latino majorities in 90, moving to minority in 2015. So, whoop. So you see Dallas, Fort Worth and Houston flipped uh, as being um, uh, 
having white, non-Hispanic, Latino uh, minorities now. Uh, and in the urban parts of the metro areas, these were white, non-Hispanic, Latino minority in 90, and these are white, non-Hispanic minority in 2015. So again, really dynamic, pretty profound process of uh, increasing diversity across the state. The other, uh, and you know, I got a sort of uh, sum up here, but we also looked at the urban suburban share of people with college degrees. And again, suburban shares increased uh, pretty dramatically over the entire period. But again, over the 10 to 15 period, maybe hinting at some type of urban inversion process, uh, the metro share of urban pop, uh, the, the urban share of the metro population with uh, college degrees or more ticked up a little bit. Again, fragile finding, but interesting nonetheless. We also found, um, this is my last slide, that as we had these dynamic processes of growth, um, poverty, um, individuals living in poverty um, also uh, became uh, a bigger, significantly bigger factor in suburban areas as we define them. So there's more suburban poverty. Now, the suburban poverty rate actually fell a little bit faster than the urban poverty rate. So the poverty population in suburban areas didn't grow quite as fast as the overall population, but the share of metro individuals living in poverty uh, definitely uh, tracked towards suburbia. So these are just some, uh, again, sort of very broad outlines of cross sections and trends. Uh, we're cranking away again at more sort of detailed data, similarity and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but I just want to give you a flavor. Now I want to turn it over to Stephen Richter, who's going to talk about uh, land consumption and land use um, in this period of rapid growth. Mm -hmm. All righty. So Dr. Bjorn Sleto uh, talks about some of his research, and he talks about the idea of inspiration being a source, a driving force for research before you even get to the research questions. And for me, my inspiration is when I look at this data, which I'll talk about a little bit more, this is land cover data, I just feel like I can look at the city of Austin, which is what we're looking at now. The red is the developed, green, dark green is forest, brown is cropland, and then we have some grassland, hay, pasture land kind of mix to the east of Austin. But I feel like I look at this and I, I begin to have a better understanding of what the city is, even if I've never been here before. And actually what's great about this data set is that it's dynamic over time and that we can actually visually see urban expansion. So if you just concentrate up in the upper area here, this is where we have the most rapid expanding portion of the metro region in Austin from 2001 to 16. You can actually see this ring road, SH-45 and SH-130, you can see them being constructed and built onto the landscape, which has all sorts of ramifications potentially for how growth will occur after 2016. And conversely, if we look, for example, into the southwest or around the lakes, we see fairly small low rates of growth or expansion that actually it's only much easier to see when I jump straight from 2016 to 2001. You can see it. It happens sort of slow. And so what, what we're actually doing here is taking this dynamic process and looking at it for all the metros in Texas and capturing a few different metrics. So first, the data is called the National Land Cover Database. We have it available for 2001, 6. 11 and 16, there's land cover, which was that, uh, the color red. And then if you look here, some of the red is actually darker than the other red. That's related to what's called imperviousness, which is the ability for water to infiltrate through soil, which is a really important environmental metric. And so from these, we calculate a few metrics. Expansion is actually that rate of growth. The, de the density is looking at the number of acres of developed land and dividing up, uh, comparing that to pop residential population which actually ties into Dr. Odin's work. And when you look at some of the patterns on these metrics and some of the patterns of growth, there are some actually some uh, kind of connections between the two that I'll talk about. And then what I'm calling intensification, which is the qualitative change of the developed landscape itself based on, in this case, imperviousness. And in the future, there will be tree canopy. Just think about 
being in a parking lot, nothing but concrete and no trees being the most intense kind of landscape you can be in from an urban perspective versus walking out of these buildings here being surrounded by giant oak trees being kind of a less intense. Um, just kind of overall metric summary, we can see, uh, as we all know, Texas is growing. Uh, so we have the population growth, which Dr. Odin talked about. We see substantial growth in the development uh, of acreage, and I'll talk about the percents in a second. And just to give you an idea, we went from 3.7 per, uh, three people per acre to 4.29. This is a little different than the kind of population densities that you're used to looking at, partly because this doesn't include parks, this doesn't include any uh, undeveloped land. It's only the developed landscape. And this equates to being across developed metropolitan Texas, roughly 3,000 people per square mile, which is still fairly low. Uh, and then we can see the, the percent imperviousness goes up from close to 32 to 34.7%. But really, the focus is not just on these numbers. It's really what's happening over time. And so we can see population growth. I'm dividing this into three periods. 2001 to 6, 6 to 11, and 11 to 16, and this is really based off of those, the data availability from the National Land Cover Database to try and compare land kind of patterns versus some of these other patterns. Population growth slows slightly, but what we really see here, one of the, probably the biggest findings here is we see a major drop in the rate of expansion, much quicker than the drop in actual population growth, and simultaneously we see an uptick in density, which is something that makes a lot of sense intuitively as you grow, grow denser you're gonna to begin to use less land. And we see some slowing, slowing down in the increase in the development of imperviousness. Um, partially because once you get to certain levels of imperviousness, like cities like Dallas or Houston, they're around 40 to 45% impervious. They can't really increase beyond that, it looks like. There seems to be sort of upper limits. So I'm gonna just share a few key findings. There's a lot of graphs in the report, a lot of data available in the report. I'm gonna just try and tease out a few of the bigger pieces. Probably the biggest finding is this reduction in expansion. So the metric I'm using here is 153, sorry, 153 acres per 1,000 new residents. Now those 1,000 new residents could be births, they could be migration and so forth. Um, 153 acres per 1,000 new residents between 2001 and 2006. Pretty close in 2006 to 11, 147, and then we see what is about a 30% drop after the recession. And then when I was first looking at this data, I didn't have the 11 to 16, I only had these two, and I was thinking, wow, it's probably gonna come up after the recession. And then actually I was kind of surprised to see a major drop. How does this compare to national averages? Texas, like what we'll hint at with the water, is actually sort of average, both in terms of the amount of land that's consumed per person and the amount of water that's consumed per person. We always think of ourselves, Texan-wise, as being exceptional, so I was surprised to see the average. Um, but to put into context, Texas is growing more compactly, but how does this compare, let's say, to California? California would be at 48 in this time period, so almost half. And what about Oregon with its growth boundaries? Oregon would be at a quarter, at 28 acres per 1,000 new residents. So while Texas is beginning to grow more compact, you can see that, that kind of uh, density of 3,000 people per square mile is still fairly low, generally, and there's a lot of room for increasing efficiency in terms of how land is used by our cities. Another major finding, now this is actually not a major finding, but it's kind of one of the findings that isn't surprising, is that as you increase in density, so that El Paso is the densest MSA, uh, we didn't have it in the data before, but it's because of the household sizes tend to be higher, especially in a lot of the borderland areas, they, they have higher levels of density despite not having a ton of um, you know, larger buildings. Uh, but as you decrease in density, you substantially increase in the consumption of land. And some of this, especially with some of these cities, it tends to be in the influence because they're so small of industrial development. Um, but you still see it in areas that um, Odessa, for example, uh, is still almost 400 people per 1,000 new acres of, uh, 400 acres per 1,000 new residents. Uh, where we're beginning to get some less clear relationships is we have density imperviousness. Now this relationship is, looks pretty positive. We have increasing imperviousness as you increase in density. Again, El Paso is the densest and close to the most impervious. Houston, Laredo, some of these cities are really high levels of imperviousness and high levels of density. Where this relationship kind of falls apart though is actually if we start looking at this as change over time. So as we densify, do you automatically increase in density uh, and imperviousness? And it, even here in Austin, in some of the debate around code next and the land development code, a lot of the fear is that by increasing density, we will increase the intensity of our landscape. And while in some cases that's true, 
Uh, for example, uh, Temple Colleen is densifying a little bit by 0.4 people per uh, developed acre. Uh, you have other places that are increasing in density without really intensifying, and you have places that are sort of uh, in becoming more impervious without necessarily becoming more dense. And so the relationship in terms of change or in terms of dynamics seems like planning makes a really big difference in terms of the relationship between these two. Um, and then another one of my key findings here is the concentration of intensification in central Texas. And this holds up not just across the state here. So we have Austin, which changed more than any other metropolitan region in the country in terms of intensification. San Antonio, Killeen, and Waco are all on the I-35 corridor, and College Station is fairly close. Not only are these the top in the Texas, these would be the top in the top 10 or the top five, really, in the entire United States, it's, which really makes sense. The I-35 corridor is where population growth is concentrating. And so there is this relationship between larger, as cities get bigger, they do become more intense. But it's something that, from a resilience perspective, particularly taking into account threats posed by climate change, like increased flooding or heat island, something that is a really big issue for planners moving forward. Um, so the next steps just for this research, I've already been working with the entire, the land cover databases for the whole contiguous United States. These little pink things are all the MSAs, and so I've actually been crunching these numbers for every MSA for the whole United States. Uh, it helps put Texas in perspective and understand, you know, maybe which areas are growing quicker or slower in terms of the usage of land. I haven't mentioned it yet, but the Chicago land, uh, St. Louis and Milwaukee areas, while we're, we're uh, in Texas are consuming 106 acres, they're more like 400 acres per thousand new residents. So the, and this, this actually meets up with what we read in the literature about the, the deeper south here and the Midwest being the areas that actually consume the most land. A lot of that has to do with the concentration of growth in these large metros in the Texas Triangle, where the cities have gotten so large that they can't really help but increase some, some density centrally. Um, and then so really the next step is to really begin to break this down, not just by metropolitan areas, which as Dr. Odin alluded to, has suburban and urban, and there's actually a lot of different spaces within each of these metros. So breaking it down by the urban area versus the non-urban area to try and identify urban and exurban trends. Looking at the census tracts, which I'm working on right now. I've got code running. It's been running for two days. My computer's literally shutting down. Uh, so I'm probably going to need help from the Texas Advanced Computing Center. You guys maybe saw they just had a big announcement. We have like the biggest computer of any university in the, I don't know. Let's call it the universe. Uh, and then census places. And this one really helps. So for those of you that don't know, a place, city of Austin and Round Rock, for example, would be different places. And that very first image I showed you where we saw really darker colors in the north, that's outside the city of Austin. So that's something as planners, we may be, you know, we can manage imperviousness in the city of Austin really well. But once you get out of the city of Austin, those are still the same watersheds. And so trying to kind of tie this place and watershed and into maybe some environmental justice and some sort of planning analyses. In addition, I want to add the tree canopy layer, which they're about nine months late in delivering. Uh, and then they have a really interesting uh, layer called impervious type where they actually differentiate what is the imperviousness. Um, so that's kind of the next steps. Happy to talk more about the land stuff. Those of you that know me know I'm uh, pretty chattery, so beware. And now we're going to switch to water. Oh, set up again. Thank you. Great. I'm going to take about 10 minutes and give you an overview of some of the water research we did over the past year. Um, we have a lot more data that Stephen's collected and is just ready to be analyzed. So that's on my agenda for the rest of the semester. Um, but I wanted to give you just kind of a, a glimpse of some of the indicators we pulled together for this report. So as you guys know, even if you've just moved here this month, Texas has incredible water resources, right? So this is Hamilton Pool, which looks perfect today, Friday, after a long week. Um, we also have correspondingly large number of water problems. So this is Shoal Creek at 15th and Lamar in summer and connected to what Stephen was just talking about because the, all the impervious cover in Austin and other metro areas, it's kind of a stranded creek. It's cut off from groundwater flows for the most part. It's cut off from kind of percolation from rain through the soil. So we have this real, in many places in Texas, feast or famine relationship with water. Um, this would be famine. This would be feast. It's pixelated, but this is the same creek just a few blocks north in one of those May flash flood events we had a couple years ago. This is the one that came up so quickly 
that um, there was a guy walking down the sidewalk by House Park and he ended up climbing that chain link fence to get out of the creek and was rescued by helicopter. So it's, um, it's a really intense, uh, incredible water landscape that we have here in Texas uh, throughout our metro regions. Um, access to water infrastructure as well is another huge topic in the state and metro areas, every metro area to some degree. We're really fortunate to have Dr. Miriam Solis, who I don't think is here today, but she's our newest faculty member in planning and part of her research agenda focuses on this and the equity uh, implications of it. So we have lots of stuff to talk about with water. Uh, water quality, right? Whether it be the boil notice last fall, I guess about a, a year ago, or not letting your dogs in the lake this summer. Um, but this report just focuses on the water supply piece because we just had to focus on something and because we have a great data set for this. Um, we are lucky as Texans that we've been doing water planning for over 50 years at this point. So we have long data sets to look at a lot of questions of water supply. This is our, um, like Travis, so this is our water reservoir water supply for Austin during the midst of the 2011 drought. And it's kind of classic American West bathtub picture of the water supposed to be up here, but it's down here and that's all the, the rings of limestone. So we look at water supply and limit it to that for this report, but we hope to do other aspects of water later on. So I just wanted to mention, in case some of you are interested in these data, which are available, um, Stephen pulled, for what we're talking about today, everything from two sources, both from the Texas Water Development Board, which is our state water planning agency. Um, one is a water use survey that they've been conducting since the 70s. The questions vary a little bit. It needs a little bit of cleaning up, but it is a, a cool resource. The other one is this massive um, database that informs the state water planning process. And I won't dwell on it too much, but there's you can drill down for information about projected demands that every metro area or any place in the state has for water demand, how much water supply they have available, um, the pro pro projected potential shortage, which is what's called need, so kind of the difference between supply and demand. And then how are we gonna make up that difference? Like kind of the imagination that happens as planners. What are you gonna do? So you can drill down and there's lots, I think this is, your animation, right? <laughs> Lots of cool detail there. So I just want to put that on your radar in case you have a project that could use these data because we have them aggregated now. Um, so this is a little bit of a spaghetti graph, but I wanted to just pull out a couple of things to try to piece together the story of what's happening with water supply and water use in metro areas in Texas over the past 20, 30, five years. So the first, really the take home I want you guys to bring back from this is that if you think about that split between metropolitan and non-metropolitan areas in the state that Michael was talking about earlier, um, we're really at this tipping point where the bluish gray line represents water use in metropolitan areas, and the orange line represents water use in non-metro areas. And this is towards the end of it, around 2015, you're actually just seeing the point where we're now actually using more water statewide in metropolitan areas, which is significant, right? That's a shift that means lots of different things as far as water use, water supply, water politics, water planning. Um, I don't wanna get into too much of the rest of it, but that's kind of a take home, just thinking about that shift, it's important. Another kind of big takeaway from the research that we did pull together for this indicator report, um, this is kind of a good news, bad news slide, right? So the, the first part of the bar chart is showing good news, which is that in aggregate, across the state, almost everywhere, um, metropolitan areas have gotten more water efficient over time. So measured by per capita water use, how much water a resident of Texas, or of Austin or El Paso uses every day, has gone down um, over time starting, these data go back to 1980, um, wrapping up in 2016. So that's what that top one shows, and that's good news. But as you can kind of guess, putting together the pieces of this report, from the information that Michael presented, we're adding people every day. And those people aren't bringing any water to Texas, right? So there, there's the, the conflict that we got. We're doing better, we're more water conservation, better per capita water use. We're still adding people, which means water demand is going up and the need for water is going up. But we're kind of out of a lot of sources of water. So that's kind of the, the crux of it. So here you can see, I just put this up in case you wanted to see if you're from Texas, where your hometown is. And again, I apologize about El Paso's disguised as Alaska kind of in the corner of the map here because my funky graphics, but um, we will clean this up before we take it on the road. But you can kind of see the darker blue are the, the uh, metro metropolitan areas that have had um, a biggest decrease in per capita water use. So these are the, the cities that are winning, the water, the water wars. They're reducing their water use at um, the biggest percentage over that time from 1980 to 2016. And then no surprise probably, the ones on, if those of you from East Texas, 
some of them actually, they all have increased a little bit, right? And that's because you guys have a lot of water. <laughs> it's just not as much on your agenda. Um, it's the parts of the state that are really having a water crunch that are investing in behavioral changes and infrastructure changes for this um, per capita water use decrease. But that's good news. Um, this is another spaghetti one. We're not gonna go into it much, except that we do have data that you could look at if you wanna break out different water uses and metropolitan areas and see how that's changed over time. That's just cool. So I kind of wanna wrap up here thinking about that good news that uh, metropolitan areas are more water efficient over time, using less water per inhabitant per resident. Um, with the news that, no surprise to you guys, that we're still growing, so then there's incre increasing water demand and the need for water supply, if you kind of put those pieces together, you end up in a lot of places, metropolitan areas have what the Water Development Board calls a water need. So kind of the projected water need, in this case in 2070. And again, the size of the circle shows how much more water these metropolitan areas might need compared to today. These are projections, but they are based on numbers. They don't acknowledge climate change, <laughs> these numbers, unfortunately, because it's from the Water Development Board, but they are based on population projections and water supply projections not taking into account climate change. So it could be worse, probably is. But regardless, <laughs> you can see, and I'm not gonna call out those of you from Dallas-Fort Worth, but you can see where the water is gonna go, right? Or the water demand is and where the water need is. So this is a pinch and we have to figure out this because I probably didn't mention, but almost all surface water in the state is pretty much allocated at this point. Groundwater is really sensitive. That is a buffer. Increasingly metropolitan areas will probably be drawing some of that water out. Um, but it's not sustainable, so we have to figure out something else. And that's where you guys, as planners and designers, come in, right? What's next, policymakers? How do we figure this out? And there's lots of research on it that I'm not getting into now because we might have lots of time for questions. But the take homes for this bit of this report, for you guys, just that we're at this tipping point where metro areas are using more water than non metro areas in the state. So that is changing things. Um, we're doing a good job of reducing our water use per capita in our metropolitan areas but that's being, and through water conservation mostly, but that's being outweighed by increasing water use because of population growth. So we're at this time where a lot of things are in flux, which is good as far as innovation and change, but it also means we need to kind of figure it out pretty quickly, especially with continued population growth and, and climate change coming down as well. So that's, I wanna wrap up the water piece there and then just briefly touch on a couple other projects that are part of the Texas Metro Observatory, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, Julie Felkner, Dr. Julie Felkner, who's in the, where is Julie? Hi, Julie. <laughs> Do you want to say a word? Um, so Julie and her team are going to continue this work this year and uh, start maybe looking at some other metropolitan areas. And then this um, beautiful image of nonprofit density and connection. So uh, Patrick Bixler over at the LBJ School is another partner on this project. Um, and he is creating these network maps of governance, specifically focused on nonprofits that are providing some of the services, and in some cases even infrastructure, in Texas metro areas. The idea being that with some of the shifts that Michael was talking about, where his populations are living in different parts of town and existing services infrastructure, are, you know, perhaps some of that gap is being filled by the nonprofit sector. So he's trying to see how robust it is in different areas. This is San Antonio's map. Um, I don't do network analysis. I can see the connections, but I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> he's not here. So just one last announcement before we do questions. Uh, we had hoped, because we are ambitious, <laughs> that we would have our platform launched by the end of the summer, it didn't happen for various reasons. We're gonna get launched this fall, so we don't have our web address, the short one yet, but I would encourage you by Halloween, <laughs> I'm putting a timeline on it, to go to the Plan Texas 2050 website through UT, just Google Plan Texas 2050 and TMO, and you'll find us, and you'll be able to link to some of the data and the reports and the um, products that we're collecting. I also wanna, other ways to get out the word, we're gonna host a faculty lunch sometime this October before the big ACSP conference is our bookend on that, where we can sit down and we'll buy you lunch and you guys can talk about maybe uses you would have for the data that we've collected or 
products that you would like to share through this um, interface. And then the last thing, and he gave me permission to put his email up here, but Stephen has generously offered that if you have um, a data need and you're serious about it and you're ready to kind of start digging into some of this data for a research project of your own, uh, for a PR thesis, he's totally willing to take emails um, from you guys. So water stuff, land stuff, uh, demographic people stuff. So let's uh, open up for questions, I think. Yes. Oh, you know, there's a microphone for this. I think we're supposed to, um, you want to go? Pass that around? And then I guess we're supposed to pass this around for us. It's the recording. It's, oh, it's being, you guys are being recorded live. It's ACL. Yeah. <laughs> but you have it. <laughs> Okay, okay. okay. Regarding, I think, Professor Odin's presentation, what was the what was the rationale behind choosing twenty five thousand and seventy five percent as your dividing line in your metrics? Why label region and a dichotomy two values rather than a more continuous gradient labeling? Because my intuition believes that labeling on a more gradient scale, where there are multiple categories more than two, will be more accurate than splitting into just two groups based on, it seems, I'm guessing not, it's arbitrarily chosen 25,000, 75%. So my question is, what is the scientific rationale behind choosing these values and only splitting the two groups, urban and suburban, when in reality, there's a far more gradient change in population density? I find it difficult to, maybe due to my naivete, to academically rely on conclusions if they aren't scientifically based and if they are arbitrary. Yeah, well, I think it's unscientific, but... Um, it's, um, you know, it was a tough choice. I mean, basically, this was derived from a pretty sub substantive literature review of how people define city versus suburb, et cetera. And the most common uh, definitions are the ones that we have plus the age of the housing stock. Right? The idea of being older housing stock is urban, more urban, newer housing stock is suburban. But because Texas cities are growing so fast, the age of the housing stock turned out not to be very helpful. So we kind of dropped that. Now, um, now when we get into the track level data, census track level data, we will be working on a more refined gradient. So you know, we can distinguish between kind of core urban areas, older suburbs, newer suburbs, exurbs, and quasi-rural or semi-rural. But just for this, you know, this was just kind of like, okay, let's come up with this kind of accepted definition of urban versus rural and see if we can see some patterns. But you're right, but what, we didn't make this up. We did, it did come from a literature review, so I would say it's somewhat scientific. So. <laughs> Um, so for, for the uh, the 2070 water projections, yeah. why did they not take climate change into account? Uh, okay. <laughs> <Fair> enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there knows, it's it's great. Long tradition of denying it. I, okay. <laughs> that, <laughs> it, the, the data then, like, how useful is that? It's not. I mean, I think you can already see we have a water problem, and we know it's going to make worse. Right? You can already see it happening. And it's not just less rain, it's also more evaporation. So it's kind of just um, But, you know, things do change. So maybe we can always run the numbers ourselves. Um, I had a question about that same graph. Where do you get water from when you have a water need? Do you dip it in? Or? Oh, when you run out? Oh, what are the strategies? Yeah, I didn't get into it. Um, I don't think I pulled the slide because it's hard to see. There's lots of different kinds. Of the, the biggest sources moving forward are conservation and uh, reuse. Uh, 30 to 40 percent of future water comes not from increasing our water use, but from increasing it. Uh, and then there's new technologies. There's aquifer storage and recharge. San Antonio stores an entire year's worth of water in the aquifer. 
outside and they restore that during that time. It's like a dam like the one that we saw with Lake Travis, except for it doesn't lose water to evaporation, which is a huge deal. And then there's brackish desalinization and huge volumes of slightly salty water on the ground that, so there are new sources, they're a lot more expensive, they're seawater, it's a lot more expensive. Uh, they are relying heavily on reuse and conservation and they've actually aligned policy in terms of the SWIFT fund towards requiring investment from the state in those areas. Um, but in a place like Dallas, they're building some giant green reservoir someplace. And it's, at this point, we sort of know not really the best strategy. But you are right. Over time, mostly, yeah, it's bringing them somewhere else. But we're kind of out of water to bring in from other places. Or it's groundwater, it's controversial. San Antonio has kind of a stellar reputation as water conservation. So we might have a little bit. Well, I mean, if you look like a longer term on sort of the history of census data, that's kind of a snoozer topic. But, um, but um, you know, formerly they had very detailed decennial census data, <coughs> but that was it. Uh, and in, what was it, 2003 or two or something like that, they went to the American Community Survey, which does a smaller sample, but they do it every year. So actually, you know, intercensal years you have better data, but the census years is the data is not so good. So you have to rely on these ACS. I think one uh, you know positive note is it looks like we're going to do a 2020 census without all sorts of uh, absurd fetters put on the census process. Uh, so we will have a decennial census. It will hopefully be reasonably well done. Uh, and not have questions that suppress people's participation in the census. But um, yeah, there's, there's not going to be more census data in the next five, you know, in terms of frequency and depth. I don't think you're going to see it to, in the next five years or so. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Okay. Can I ask one more? Sure. I was just, you know, good news in terms of the per capita water use reduction and the fact that it's not those, but did you get a sense of how it stacks up with the country? Like, are we, are we, you know, middle of the pack, like on land use? We are or? middle of the pack, we are average. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, it's a little bit apples and oranges than it is when we do get off the path of the day because yeah. everyone divides them differently. Um, so, if we use data, more than that, we still use sort of other things like fire fighting. Commercial, you know, commercial, offices. A lot of times, people will only do residential, and you'll get a much lower number. Yeah. So really, the best cross comparison data for uh, the nation is focused more on the domestic household. And when that, you look at that, Texas is about 82 percent gallons per day. Person. Um, and then you look at the average is about 80. So mm -hmm. um, you know, in some places where the rates are just really good. I actually brought this on in Texas because I thought so. It's not alphabetical, it's like water use. So here's Texas. And there's Idaho, there's Idaho. Does that include watering lawns? Don't eat your potatoes. This is residential for Calabasas. Yes, it includes watering lawns, which is a huge amount, right? So that's really what that's got around the So I was just curious. Yeah. Well, irrigation lawns, not agricultural lawns. This is just residential, so this is just like household recipes. So yeah. But yeah, I'm not a Calabasas. 
I, mean, I, th I think one thing that kind of emerged just again from this kind of initial thing, which we're really, you know, going to try to probe in a lot more detail, is there seems to be over the last five years or so some sort of correspondence of trends where maybe we're urbanizing a little more, maybe we're increasing density more, maybe we're reducing water consumption per capita more, which may suggest that the way our urban settlement is happening is shifting to some extent, but it's a very short time period. And definitional issues are, you know, but still, it's interesting that, you know, it's kind of fractal. Those things all seem to kind of correspond to each other. So it does suggest there might be a shift going on. And one of the data sets we're working with more is all the water data we showed you is by year. They actually have within the year distributions by month. And using that, you can estimate the outdoor water use that typically happens in the summer. Um, the data is not quite as clean, and so it needs to be used a little bit more carefully. Um, but trying to align that with are there are other measures like density and seeing are there different kind of relationships between the people, land and water that all kind of tie together into this sort of new form of development. Does this graph account for the farming water use? No. Or do no. It's just oh, residential. Really? It's just residential. Well, domestic. Really? Oh. Yeah. That would be much. Oh, well, yeah, I was assuming much that's why I don't know in Utah or so. Oh. Watering lawns. Maybe they have the water available to do so to regulate it. Do we have a question over here? Um, were there, yeah, kind of on this graph, was any indication of, like, again, maybe just some representative examples of why city states have certain water, residential water use patterns? Yeah, that's actually kind of the next step we want to do, just at the Texas scale, kind of look at what we got to get so far and say, okay, hey, why, you know, just as some surprises, um, Abilene. Why is Abilene doing so great? Yeah. And, you know, El Paso has always been doing great. You know, what's the, I mean, we already know the same story. Um, nationally, it is, it is frustrating. It's hard to sort it out because it's just so different with climate and kind of cultural behavior and norms about do you have a water, do you not have a water? Um, so, yeah, there's kind of case by case qualitative stuff, but there's nothing kind of across the nation yet that's really picking up. It would be fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's hard. And there's also no central water database for the nation. There's, this is from USGS, and there's so many stuff, but it's not a deep dive into the most Texas is collecting. Um, but it's a good question. Some of it is related to building codes, efficient fixtures, more, you know, we have a lot of stock in Texas that probably helps bring usage down because we have less leaky pipes in some of the buildings and uh, more low usage faucets and stuff like that. But that's the kind of thing itself is a major research endeavor just to dive into that and the detail that would be required to really answer that. So if you want to do a PR thesis on it, Go for it, yeah. A huge piece is, is long water. So in a place yeah, where you can use rain, then you don't have to These places are wet. These places are drier. I mean, there is, there is that outdoor usage is the biggest scare.